Hey, fellow tennis nerds, I'm here with a favorite, Eliza Westcote returns to the pod. It was in October, we talked last time, and she has been growing her following, deservedly so. Started a YouTube channel, Eliza West, uh, but the rapidly growing Instagram account is It's Eliza's World. It's probably the same on uh, TikTok, if I'm not mistaken. She can correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Today we'll get into the Australian Open, which is currently ongoing. Lots of upsets, lots of fashion choices we're going to discuss and more. So welcome to the pod again, Eliza. Thanks so much for having me back. Super excited to be here. It's always fun to chat tennis with you. So um, what's been going on? Like, how's, how's YouTube going? Is it is it worse to do longer videos or, or what do you feel about it? <laughs> uh, yeah, YouTube's fun. You know, I'm definitely going to spend more time and effort and energy this year providing some long form content. I think I'm just sort of dipping my toe in the water right now, trying to figure out how to do it, how it all works, how to be like you <laughs> and um, just, you know, have fun with it. So hopefully... That'll kind of uh, have some more time and space to grow that channel. But as you say, just kind of really focused on trying to build the community on Instagram and create an audience that would even want to engage with me on on long form content. Yeah, it requires a little bit more, but it's also like, I mean, if you're building an audience, they will like even more of you. So, right. Like, so you, if you longer mm -hmm. pieces will be, will be probably very well received usually, but it's like, it requires more like to do the editing and stuff, but that's about it, you know? Yes. Yeah. I'm learning. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're getting into it. You're getting very good. So uh, what do you think about the Australian Open so far? How many, like, how weird is it to be in LA and watch the AO? Is it really bad time zone wise? I think it's a little better than the East Coast. But so Australia is 19 hours ahead of me. So I do get to kind of watch the, I guess, like first start of the matches from like 4.30 onwards my time. I kind of start catching a couple matches and then usually up till like one or two try to keep my eyes open and watch as much as I can. Um, it's funny, I was actually thinking I lost more sleep during the US Open with how many of those matches went late and, um, you know, that wasn't for time difference reasons. So uh, I think I've been able to actually watch a fair number of matches and definitely better timing than being on the East Coast or in Europe. Yeah, yeah. In Europe, it's funny. I mean, like, if you wake up in the morning pretty early, you can watch, but then, like, there's already been X number of results. So you, you wake right. up, you check your app, you're like, oh, no, I shouldn't be on my phone just after waking yeah. up. Because yeah. <laughs> so, Andrew Huberman told me, right? So uh, so then you have to be like, okay, uh, let's get going with, with watching something. But it's nice. You have a morning yeah. coffee and you watch some tennis. It's, it's pretty good. I, I don't mind. Yeah, I love it. And I had that the other day. Medvedev was still playing by the time I woke up. So I got, you know, tennis on the bookend of each of my days. So... I'm always happy when that's the case. So what has stood out to you uh, in the tournament so far? Have you have there been any moments or any special like things that you're like, oh, wow, okay, this was cool or this was not good? or? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely interesting on the WTA side how many seeds have fallen. Um, <laughs> I didn't expect that this time around. I mean, I really, I was really focused on that, you know, top four group and um, them kind of really having... A first tournament where a lot of where all four of them make it deep i was really hopeful for that um i think my pick was savalenka to win so at least she's she's still amongst the pigeons but um yeah i i, I didn't expect so many upsets especially that early on um you know losses from players like pagula or jabor to see her fall in the way that she did against andriva but and they're losing to players that are playing really well in those matches but um you know, I thought we were getting towards a period of stabilization in terms of top 20 players in the WTA. And uh, it's definitely thrown a spanner in the works as to, you know, who's going to grab an opportunity and run with it. But it's also great to see a couple of names that have been knocking on the door, like a Svitolina or an Azarenka, that have really great stories that now kind of have, you know, perhaps more of an opportunity than they would if some of the the big dogs were still in the tournament and that makes for an interesting storyline in my opinion. Yeah, that's true. I, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing that it's so open? Like now, I mean, I also thought like the usual like suspects, Friontek, you know, Rybakina, uh, but then obviously everything changes as, as the tournament progresses. Do you think it's like a, a bad thing for the marketing of the WTA to have like so open tournaments? Yeah, I could see arguments either way. Um, you know, I think the typical argument usually is around oh well WTA players are not consistent and there's no one dominant force and that makes it boring because it's super unpredictable and then I also you know can see the camp on the other side that's like yeah it is super unpredictable every match you know could be an upset and that makes it interesting and um, you can't 
hedge your bets too strongly against one person. And sometimes with with the ATP side over the years, you know, some folks have felt like, okay, it's the same storyline over and over again, and it's the same names, and I want to see somebody else win it. And we're just about maybe getting to that phase where that conversation with the ATP tour feels realistic in terms of really entertaining names outside of the big three, big four um, consistently and kind of getting excited about the prospect of potentially somebody else winning. So unless you're, you know, a huge Novak Djokovic fan or a huge Nadal fan and you want to see those players win every time, I think that is a nice juxtaposition with the WTA where it's not one dominant force that's cleaning up all the time. So for me, it keeps things interesting to kind of have the best of both with both tours. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Like a way, nice way of putting it because now you have like, okay, it can be boring. I mean, even now with Novak just like swiping everything, you thought like, here comes Alcaraz, here comes uh, other players, Rune uh, and whatever. But but it's mm-hmm. just still like the big three on the men's side has been so dominant and he's still like, he's still protecting it kind of the, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, while on the women's tour, I mean, we had Serena, we have domination, but but I think a lot of players thought like Svantec would now be the, mm-hmm. the the player to kind of take that over. But then, you know, she's very dominant on clay, I would argue. Yeah. Um, I but that she's struggling in the hard course against the, the players like Sabalenka, or someone who hits big, you know, who doesn't yeah. give her time, you know. Why do you think that is? Svantec. Yeah, why does she struggle against? I I think she, she maybe the swings like a little bit like she's very spin oriented like quite mm-hmm. still semi big swings. I think like if you take time away from her, she cannot kind of control the ball as well as she does on the clay where she has a little bit of extra extra time. Although it's it's mm-hmm. minute in tennis, but I think she can really like direct the ball around and she's such a good mover that on clay it's like it's very very difficult to beat her, close to impossible. But yeah. these players who hit very flat and and give you you know, almost no margin. Uh, they, they're tricky. And I thought also like Noskova in that match mm. kind of find her purple patch and then she, just like it, we, she couldn't hit, deal with it, Svontek. Maybe yeah. something else, I don't know. Um, she was she was misfiring a little bit on the forehand overall this this um, uh, tournament. So, you know, she mm-hmm. wasn't like super on form. Uh, even yeah. in the match against Collins, I thought it was just like she could have lost that one. So I was not super shocked, but a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting that it is consistently that player profile of a Collins, Ostapenko, or, you know, Noskova, those kind of big hitters upsetting her, even Rabakina. Um, and I'm curious what, you know, I'd love to know from her what her approach would be in terms of, you know, transitioning from hard court to clay court season, how she approaches that and what she's thinking about with the different surfaces, you know, how she might be able to make a run at Wimbledon in the future. I know that that's kind of a, something she's talked about. So I'm I'm fascinated by her because I think she's actually on the surface initially can come across as kind of a boring person or someone that's, you know, so shy, it's hard to kind of like her. But when I was in Cancun and had the chance to kind of see her in a press conference and how she interacts with people, she's actually, yeah, very thoughtful, um, gives very kind of honest answers, is is actually pretty easy to talk to and, um, I think is kind of growing into her role as world number one and as someone that, you know, people are are looking to, to have opinion, to have some leadership. And um, I know that there's a lot of pressure when these tournaments come around to, you know, not only kind of represent women's tennis as number one, but to kind of get the results that back that up. And I think she's doing a better and better job, but yeah, that same profile of player seems to kind of knock her, knock her off her game every time. And so, Clearly, some adjustments need to be made. Either that, or um, yeah, she she relies on the clay season really being her best. Uh, best yeah, season. I mean, she she did win the U.S. Open, so that's a good sign. Yeah. Uh, I think Wimbledon will be very tough, like with okay. her game. Uh, but mm-hmm. even I mean, Nadal managed to conquer it. A lot of people said Nadal will never win Wimbledon. He did uh, sure. a few times, so uh, she can do it. She was trying to shorten her swings. That's what I heard from from coaches and people in the industry, but it takes mm-hmm. time. You can't just like, oh, she's going to work on that and then win a, win a Australian Open. So, and also yeah. I, I guess Sapalenka, for example, like she, she looks so good. It's, it's yeah, it's hard to see anyone who can beat her. But then if we know Sapalenka, she can get to have a match where she's a little bit off against right. uh, one of the better players towards the semifinal. And then, you know, you have another upset there. <laughs> so we'll see. You. Yeah. Yeah. I know some people are complaining about the draw as well. And, um, you know, 
facing someone like a Collins in a third round that's beaten you before and um, that's made you know an Australian Open final and you know the type of player that she is I think yeah maybe um I think it was Kustuk yesterday who made some interesting comments about every slam is different every draw is different and you know you could be playing some some great matches and and your opponent is winning theirs oh and one and two and three and having an easy run with it and so they just have much more gas in the tank so i thought that that was also kind of an interesting factor with how the seeds are at the moment as to you know who's going to end up in what quarter and and get the tough matches early on yeah yeah exactly the draw is super important like i think that's becoming more and more clear for everyone like even if you're not watching tennis that much but it's like if if you have a bad draw, it can really hurt your chances. Like it's it's yeah. uh, it's one of those most important things, and you can really have a sleeper player just going through the draw if it's like easy match after easy match, and there've totally. been lots of examples of that in history. And this was not an easy draw for her, so I, I can understand that. I mean, we had some, we shared some um, exchanges over over Instagram. Uh, Ostapenko, I thought she looked like she worked in a worked in a fast food restaurant, but she played amazingly <laughs> well. As uh, her outfit, that kind of it was a little bit interesting. Uh, what did you think? Am I out there? No, my... no. She's uh, constantly get messages about what is Ostapenko wearing and, and why. Um, before I rip into her, I always like to say that the players that, you know, have their own lines that are kind of doing their own thing outside of the big brand sponsorships and big deals, I do admire. You know, they're leaving money on the table in some situations. And I think it's also particularly interesting from the women's side of like, you know, what business opportunities and things are you pursuing outside of your tennis that, you know, give you more avenues to to make money later in life. And I'm not saying her DK one line is going to take off and sell out, but I think for her, it's a clearly a passion and something she enjoys doing. Now, whether that looks good is a different question. I think sometimes I feel like it's purposefully designed to be so unesthetically appealing to have conversation around it and that's kind of just her personality and how she wants to present herself but yeah i mean it's not a, it's not a flattering outfit at all um i the only bit i like is the the purple jacket that goes over the top which hides all of the the chaos going on on top so um but uh yeah i mean she she had a great season down under and you know got a double title singles title and I thought she was a player that could definitely have a good run in in the AO and meeting Azarenka as early as she did, then, you know, that's tricky because they, they kind of have an interesting head to head. So um, she had her chances in that second set and, and couldn't take them. So, but I would love actually for Ostapenko to have a really strong season and stay in and amongst the top 10 because I just think she's such a character and a personality that makes women's tennis fun to watch and, uh, unpredictable at moments as well. Yeah, I think the the aggro she brings is something I like as well. I like a bit of aggro. I, if everybody's yeah. buddies is not so much fun, but but she's yeah, like exactly. she's really bringing that. I know when uh, Asenka was serving, she was kind of like stomping her feet to make the squeaky noises, you know, with her <laughs> with her sneaker. And it's like okay, it's a kind of gamesmanship, but fine, you know, it's it's funny. And uh, but Asenka yeah. is. I think a problem player for her because she gets even more fired up and plays better because she knows that she's going to throw this stuff at her. So I think it was yeah. pretty interesting uh, matchup for her because a lot of players probably would be like, oh, I'm going crazy with this. What are you <laughs> doing with the shoes? And then you, you lose your focus for like five minutes and it's 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 set this over, right? Yeah, no, I, I love having Mavericks like that on, on the tour. And, you know, I think you have, in a way, more men who are doing those types of things. You, you think of the kind of Daniel Medvedev type of antics that just is, it's funny and it's just ridiculous at moments. And I'm sure it pisses your opponent off or, but if you come into the match kind of knowing that these things are, are coming your way and, um, you know, and you laugh about it and you kind of have a good time or you use it to fuel yourself and play better than, you know, it, it it's fine. And I think for the fan, it's, always good to have these different types of personalities. I, I'm sort of with you. I don't like the buddy, buddy, good sportsmanship 24 seven approach. I like the type of person who's going to break the rules a little bit. <laughs> I remember what you said as yourself as a player is kind of a player that gets a bit feisty on the tennis court, right? <laughs> I feel like I need to express myself. Like I'm not uh, the type of person that would do well if you told me to like hold it all in and and bottle it up and I actually was listening to your podcast uh, last weekend where you guys uh, you and Nikolai were talking about um 
you know, whether it's good or not to say the come ons and scream or, you know, kind of, especially at a lower or rec level. And I very much felt or resonated with that, that I'm the type of person that like needs to talk to myself and needs to kind of continue the active engagement. Otherwise my mind is, um, complicit in being complacent and, and that's no good either. <laughs> yeah. It's very easy to get like too passive. So you're just ice man or ice girl or whatever. And, and you're, you're not like engaging hundred percent in the rallies, for example, it's something, uh, you know, I've, I've tried all, all kinds of approaches, uh, but it's like, you should, kind of do what comes natural to you i guess you know like you don't have to yeah. throw the fist up in the person's face when you no. when you go to the opposite ends but uh, i mean some people might find that really funny as well but uh, <laughs> but you can actually like give your own vamos and and be a little bit animated and, and maybe i mean yeah. i i work with some uh, mental trainer and that said like oh, it's important to scream or just jump or be like very explosive to wake yourself up sometimes when things are going against you you know yeah yep they can definitely resonate with with feeling like that will help me kind of uh refocus or just get the frustration out on that point and leave it behind me but um yeah i know everyone's different and i think that's also why you know you connect with different players and different personalities on the court you know for me someone like a a casper rude tries too hard to keep it all inside sometimes it's like oh mate just you know just smash the racket just let it out i want to see you have emotion but um you know, that's something he actively like doesn't want to do. And that works for him to some degree. So, um, yeah, to each their own. Yeah, true. And that may, that's what makes it interesting. If it's only like same type of player, it's going to get really boring. Uh, but yeah, some aggression is fun. Have Has anyone else stood out to you on the women's draw, like that new player? Because there's quite a lot of new players. I mean, new I'm within quotation marks, but it's mm -hmm. like the Timofeeva, there's uh, the Chinese Cheng, you know, there's a lot of players, Paulini, it's not super yeah. famous, um, yeah. that's, that are playing really well. But, we, you know, can they go further? Big question mark. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, actually, last Monday, I was talking about Linda Noskova because I watched her at the US Open last year and felt like she had a really big baseline game, you know, a really good serve for her age and then amongst those kind of younger players. Um, you know, maybe her, her movement has room for improvement, but I felt like when I watched her match uh, two weeks ago against Rabakina, I was sort of like, wow, there's a lot of pop and power there and she could really cause some people problems. So I guess, um, I'm surprised at how quickly that came up against uh, Shriantek, but then as we said, that type of player profile it, uh, doesn't doesn't really suit her. I think the other name, you know, you mentioned Paulini. I started following her a little bit last year. I think her game is interesting. She's quite small, so she's a good mover, and she's that you know type of Simona Halep type of player that's uh, you know good, good on turning the defense into the attack and has a good also good energy and personality on the court is very lively and um, brings a high intensity. So I think she is, you know, fun to watch. And for me, it's, uh, I, I love the names of, um, you know, Zhang Chenwen and, and kind of her connection with Lina and their little kind of meeting the other day at the Australian Open. I, I really want to see her have a top 10 season this year. I think she has the, the weapons to do so. And she's such a hard worker and, honestly so much fun to, to listen to in her press conference she's just so sweet like uh uh just has a lot of fun with with her tennis but uh works really hard so i'd love to see her have a good chance at, at making a deep run here yeah she should i think i predict her to do that well my predictions have been down the toilet on the women's <laughs> side so far but some of them i got right uh yeah <laughs> i got the rublev right today but that's the men's tournament nice. we'll get, yeah we'll get to that later uh, but so you had Sabalenka as the winner before the tournament and you're, mm -hmm. I mean, she has been the, maybe golf as well, but otherwise Sabalenka has been the kind of shining star who's not even looked faced one minute <laughs> and she even double bageled Surenko, which was pretty, pretty uh, interesting. Uh, so yeah. what do you think? You, you're not going to change your mind. Just can anyone threaten her by the looks of it? Um. I'm not going to change my mind for the next like couple of rounds. You know, I think a final is, is always tricky. Um, you know, anything can happen in a final type of situation and it'll just depend on, on who it is on the other side of the net. But I think, you know, the remainder of her draw through to the, to, through to the semis looks pretty good. And, um, I think she has a level of, of focus and determination that, is well balanced with also a level of enjoyment and and kind of fun 
I've always thought that she has over the last like 18 months really impressed me with her mindset. I remember the comments she made last year of sort of like, I didn't need a sports psychologist. Like I needed to fix this myself. And I think she has this sort of internal, you know, locus of control that um, is becoming more and more kind of powerful within her. That's allowing her to, you know, fight through difficult moments or also just be as dominant as she is and as free flowing as she has been this tournament. So I continue to see the improvements in her mental game, which I find really encouraging. And I don't uh, look at her, you know, losing a first set or being behind in a match and thinking, all right, that's done now and she's going to go away, which maybe she she kind of would have done in the past. Um, I think she, she is problem solving a lot better than um, she ever has. And yeah, I think she's, she's the one to be. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and you did uh, predict her dress move, which was yes. pretty impressive. The red dress. And I, I personally, I think it looks looks great. It looks like proper for for the Australian Open for Grand Slam. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think she, I think she looks great in the red. I think the the color of the outfit is awesome, and that they gave her something that was unique is important to me. I also like that that dress is available to purchase for the general public. The dress she wore at the US Open, you couldn't buy that one. That was, I guess, a one-off uh, kit made for her. I did see her interview notes from her press conference the other day where she said she you know, was very honored and very happy that Nike was dressing her in red and everybody else had their own colors, but that she would also have liked to be more involved in the design process and maybe have a different style of the dress. And it was the same thing in, at the US Open where the, the cut and shape of the dress is exactly the same as the rest of the collection. It's just a different colorway. And I think I was sort of thinking to myself, you know, what does it take for Nike to do a custom line for a player that's, you know, completely different, um, you know, is, is, is usually a big sponsorship or signing, um, you know, like the names of a Williams or a Sharapova that have a presence and existence in this sport globally beyond just tennis. And I don't think Sabalenka quite has that, you know, type of connection and, and love with, uh, you know, athletes beyond tennis and that she doesn't have the same recognition as a Williams or a Sharapova did early on in their career. And so I think Nike is taking maybe some small steps at calculated risks of like, okay, it doesn't cost us much to, you know, do this same dress in a different colorway for her. Like, let's start with that. And maybe they're sort of betting or hedging their bets on, you know, if she starts to really pile on the grand slams and is really going to take number one for a while, then maybe we'll start to see the custom kits evolve to, to more of a unique style that suits her. Um, I, I would like to see that progression, but it's hard to know whether their Nike, the brand is, is going to commit to that, or if this is kind of their new answer to, to custom kits, given the state of Nike at the moment. I know they're going through a lot of uh, layoffs and uh, financial challenges. So it wouldn't surprise me that they might just not have the resources or allocation to, to do something like that, which is crazy to even think for, for such a big company. Yeah, it seems like they've taken a pretty clear step, and that could be a part of the budgeting constraints or whatever. They they need to refocus, you know, so that they're mm -hmm. taking a little bit of a step away from tennis. And when yeah. they had pushing Ralph and, and Roger, I mean Serena, they had such a strong like you know um, sales force. That's a CRM system. No, but they had like mm -hmm. a really strong driver then in in creating sales. And I think also the kits maybe were better. Uh, technically yeah. back then, maybe it's just my nostalgic head, but it's like it mm -hmm. felt like they were putting a little bit more effort. Roger was going to be classy. Ralph was going to be like, this Serena is Serena. She has to have her own custom stuff or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. Now it feels a bit more like it's an afterthought with the tennis. And, and that's maybe why even like a superstar like Sabalenka doesn't quite get the full custom treatment or so on. So um, we will see. I mean, I guess New Balance and Coco Goff, what do you think there? Yeah, I think it's really exciting to see them leaning in on that relationship more. And again, maybe that's an example of like, okay, this player is young, like coming up, we're going to kind of take it season by season and see how it goes. And I think New Balance is a, is a company that sort of 
rebranded over the last 10 years and is sort of on the up and maybe Nike's sort of a little bit on the down. Like, I don't think you're at all nostalgic in the sense of the kits were better. The quality was better. I mean, we saw like with Fritz the other day, he had all these holes in his shoes. I mean, those were things that, you know, maybe players slide more now, but you can tell like if, if you buy Nike clothes that the um, manufacturing and the quality isn't the same that it used to be. And, that, and, and that's just uh, the reality of, of kind of where they're at across the board not just with tennis i think they've they've lost a little bit of that shine in terms of uh being a really high-end performance brand but with new balance i think what's um you know what's excellent to see is that a woman gets a custom shoe line you know she's the only player on the wta side that has that and i would love to see new balance maybe even try to get some of their top male players in a cg one and see, you know, kind of what the reception would be about a male player wearing, you know, a shoe that was originally designed, uh, you know, for for a woman first. Like, I don't think we've seen that type of dynamic, which I think would really be interesting conversation and be a first in a lot of sports to to have something like that. And I, I think they're really designing collections for Coco based on, you know, her personality and, and her style. Um, I like, I like the kit that she has. She kind of looks like a little bit like a anime, like game player, um, video game player kind of reminds me of something like that, which, uh, would make sense given what she seems to like and is kind of into, but I think she pays attention and I think she's involved in the process. And that's also really important to know that the, these lines are coming with a reflection or a personality of the player shining through and, that makes the fans want to connect with that brand even more. And I think New Balance is taking the right direction in, you know, betting on somebody like her being a, a tennis personality that has reach and presence again, beyond just the sport of tennis. Yeah, I think so. And it's pretty clear. And that's, it's nice also to see like up and coming brands or new brands with like a bit of a new approach. And we talked about Iga before. I, I mean, on, I've been testing the own shoes. So that's the reason I'm yeah. thinking about it. Um, they have the kits for, I think it was the same kit. I mean, obviously, male, female for uh, Shelton and Iga, right? Like something similar, right? Yeah, both the US Open and this one, it's the same like graphics, just a different yeah. cut. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I was curious because again, I asked her in October, you know, what she what she thought of the kits and she was excited about, you know, how they were evolving. And she also mentioned that they would be available for, for purchase probably by the Australian Open and, and they're not yet. So I'm sort of wondering what's uh, what's going on with On in terms of, you know, making those kits available. I know a lot of people are really interested and curious to get their hands on it. Um, I do think Ben looks better in the On kits than Iga does. And for me, it's primarily just the way the, the skirt is cut. I don't love the, the shape of it. But I also don't think um, I don't think it's Iga's style. You know, it's just, I have similar comments about Jabor. You know, how she looked in Lotto is now very similar to this new brand that she's with, and she wants that you know sort of baggier t-shirt with a very simple A-line skirt, and that's kind of it. And uh, you know, I wonder how much these types of relationships that are crafted around a player with a, a brand that's sort of just getting into tennis is really designing their kits around what the player wants versus what their style is, I, I don't know. But um, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't have enough flair for me to really want to invest in in an on kit right now. But I do hear the shoes are very good. Yeah, they're pretty good. I mean, I heard some durability issues from my friends, but uh, okay. that's uh, yeah, but they, they, they're they pretty comfortable. Uh, review, okay. I guess review to come. I will have to test them myself. Yeah. But it's the uh, it, it's um, it's interesting with like there's a new player. I mean, obviously, you would want the kits if you did their kits of their shoes to stand out in some hopefully very good yeah. way. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's obviously a risky take to because then people will be like, oh, yeah, it's that outlandish brand that nobody's going to wear, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I find it really odd. And it, like the same happened with, with Roger when he went to um, uh, what's what's the name of the brand? Uniqlo. Uniqlo. Um, that's is crazy. That I didn't remember that. But so he went to Uniqlo and you can't find the you couldn't find his kits anywhere. And you're like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like you have you invest so many millions into this guy who's like an icon in the sport and then you can buy the kit. Like and now the same with the Australian Open. You like if you have players, you need to be able to buy the stuff that they are endorsing. You know, otherwise, what's the point? And it's very strange to me. Yeah, hundred percent. I I think it's interesting that they also made a T-shirt for Ben Shelton that you can buy. I'm pretty sure. Um, 
that they did that with him first over her I think it shows again like the type of connection and, and sort of reverberation of a Ben Shelton that rattles the the box of traditional tennis um, probably got on more exposure than what Iga gets on, even, even as being world number one. I know she hasn't won a slam yet in the full kit. Maybe she won Rene Garros with it. But uh, yeah, I'm sort of curious to see if they'll kind of lean in on that personality maybe and and try to kind of make some fan merch i know that coco got a fan merch shirt with um new balance as well that you can buy that sort of has her silhouette of her serving and i think um yeah i think more fans would maybe want to have a couple of these types of lines that aren't necessarily a specific tennis outfit and maybe some more gear that they can wear to a tournament that shows support that allows them to engage with the brand without kind of the, in England, we have this phrase, which apologies if it's not PC, but it's called full kit wanker, where you uh, copy the exact getup of somebody else. And that's how I feel a lot of the time. If you're going to go buy the exact Coco Goff dress and top or the exact Ben Shelton dress and top, then uh, you could come across as a, as a full kit wanker. <laughs> It's a good, it's a good phrase for it, and and also like there's some famous memes or whatever online with like people who come with like a full like they have the full Federer kit, which is the most common one still I think, yeah, uh, and like full bag they have like yeah. twelve rackets whatever strong to with natural gut, and, and the poly, and then then they can't hit the ball, and you're like oh yeah. my god, <laughs> you know, it's a classic that one. It is such a classic, and I'm like get a little personal style, you know, do a little mix and match like. Make it make it different, but yeah, I, I know exactly the type of person that comes up with the headband perfectly tied, and you just sort of think like, I love you, and I love Roger Federer, but like, <laughs> you don't have to dress like him every time we play tennis. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was playing today in uh, Puerto Romano, and there was um, the court next. They were they were they were not like super good players, but I was like hitting some balls. But yeah, the guy was like full on hydrogen kit like with the skull or whatever and but also the with also the like bandana and everything and i'm like oh my god and he yeah. was not a good player sorry if he listens to this but it was like it looks so weird it looked like oh is this a famous player oh it's not it's not a famous no. yeah, no, yeah yeah you definitely have to be careful it's like um if you come if you turn up with all the gear and all the stuff then you better have uh have something to show for it uh in terms of your tennis skills i uh, and it's applied like that to all sports, you know, you don't want to rock up in whatever custom shoes or, or get up that you have and, and not play well. So um, I, I like the coordination, but I also think, you know, a lot of these collections have a lot of variety of different options. And I think that kind of, <laughs> I try to do a little mix and match and not just like blatantly copy one specific look all the time. Yeah, I think that's the whole point. Like, if you can, if you find your personality through what's available, right? That's really yeah. where the, where the thing is. Like, for if you're a player of that kind of stature, like Sabalenka, you you would want like I would also want my own kit because I mean, there's this problem. Yeah. I'm not sure if we talked about last time in tennis when you have two players of the same kit and you don't yeah. like you can hardly tell from at least TV distance like who's who in <laughs> this yeah. match, and it's yeah. so stupid, you know. I know, and I I thought Nike has done a better job this this AO with providing same cuts, different colors with dresses, tops, shorts, you know, the whole thing. So I think that was really smart from them to approach it in that way. But then I'm always curious, like if two Nike players play each other, how do they coordinate who's wearing what and who gets to pick? And um, I think there has been instances, even uh, this tournament where they've been wearing the same kit even though there's been options not to do so, which must give Nike execs a little bit of a, of a headache of like, oh, geez, we gave you guys options and you're still wearing the same thing. So I wonder, you know, how much they're even really able to have a say or control that behind the scenes or, you know, how many options a player gets. And, um, and then, yeah, I think they missed a little bit of a trick with the AO as well in terms of the night matches and having gear that can, that can layer. I know people were giving Vika a hard time for, wearing whatever co co collection that was different from this AO collection um, on top and some black leggings that, you know, didn't didn't go. So I think, uh, again, like practicality and sort of uh, approaching the full kit in mind is super important to me. If I ever was to design a line, I think it's 
crucial to think about the layers and how one you know can can reduce and add in a way that's coordinated and uh, i haven't seen a brand approach their full kit collection with that sort of mindset yet because uh, the way nike has like their hoodies or their track suits if you ever you know you're not really playing in those that's not really a practical um performance piece so i would i would like to see an evolution there as well yeah, I think there's lots to be done here. I think that's my feeling. It's just like you could approach it with a lot more holistic view. Uh, yeah. Talking about that, like, what do you think of uh, Osaka's uh, flashy jacket? <laughs> loved it. Yeah, I love that good. she still just, you know, gets the pull to do something completely different. Um, again, with her, I think a lot of the the designs have personal stories, which I always think is is important. I liked the metallic sort of stripe on the dress and how that coordinated with the bags and the shoes and. Um, she brought the drip with the LV necklace that um, was really cool to see. And again, like I, I pay attention to those things because I think of, you know, like a Maria Sharapova that was so recognizably Tiffany and, um, you know, was such a special kind of a player for them, but also, you know, allowed Tiffany to kind of have a presence in the sport beyond being the trophy manufacturer or kind of, you know, that type of role. And so... I'm not sure, you know, what Naomi's deal is with LV, but I would love to see more kind of jewelry partnerships, accessory partnerships, and not just for the women too. I know um, Zverev has has a jewelry partnership and maybe uh, Rublev does as well, but, you know, it's uh, all kind of a part of that personal style and we see it a lot with the watches, but they're not always playing with that. So um, again, kind of more opportunities for, for those brands to get their foot in the door would be fun to see. Yeah, and you need to really need to be like um, thinking about your brand. Like, who am I? What, what do you stand for? Have an idea of that. And also to yeah. tie yourself with the right sponsors. I mean, if you're a top 10 player on either women's or men's side, you should be able to pick and choose quite quite decently, at least. You're going to get some offers. And and, and like, I think Feder was always fantastic at that. Like, always the partnership seemed to suit his brand, mm -hmm. whether he yeah. did it or Mirka did it or or his agents or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it was always like a super fit. And that's how mm -hmm. you kind of create like a superhero thing, you yeah. know, when, when it's like it works. I mean, I guess Serena was also good with that. But it's, it's like yeah. uh, sometimes you get like, oh, why do you have that car sponsorship? And then you have that yeah. watch. And then it's like a little bit of a <laughs> all over the yeah. place, you know? Yeah, which is why I think the Shriontech partnership with Lego is interesting. And, you know, it's, again, something we've never seen before. She's talked about how she plays Lego, you know, before her matches as a way to focus and concentrate. And this is sort of the new age of, of partnerships and brands doing things differently. And I think, again, is tied to, you know, the importance of personal story and having a, a, a presence, a social media presence, a um, connection with, you know, a home base of fans. I think she's, you know, pretty well known in Poland and a lot of Europe as well and kind of has that good relationship and has really worked on cultivating that and um, yeah I, I'm curious what the ins and outs is financially of that deal but it, it was just such a different type of brand deal than you know what we're used to seeing with tennis which is m the majority of the time these high-end kind of fashion brands cars watches uh, you know accessories all of that type of stuff so um, yeah I wonder if there's kind of more room for players to pursue stuff that's just totally different than what we're used to seeing yeah i like that they they bring new spawn i think it's also like if you bring certain sponsors in like lego is such a um, yeah. you know huge brand especially for a younger audience but i mean it's also for adults but it's like for a younger audience you you bring a new audience instead of yeah. like i mean the tennis audience generally is kind of like you know high-end uh, country club people uh, historically yeah. not always but historically and I think if you can try to out bridge outside that, that's much better. Like find some way to do it a bit more street inspired, bring in mm -hmm. Lego. Like she's probably a wholesome figure in Poland, right? Especially yeah. so. And I know she's huge. I think some of her mental stress, which we maybe cannot reflect on in other parts of the world, is that she's such a mega star in Poland yeah. that I think, you know, she cannot go to concerts. She cannot like, live a relaxed life there. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think that also maybe affects her more than... And she's still very young, yeah. so I think maybe that will take some time to deal with, right? Yeah, for sure. And um, I think in general, we could all be a little bit more kind in terms of, of those pressures and how that's in general evolved over the last uh, 10, 15 years with social media and, and betting and kind of all of that just becoming so much more invasive than it used to be. 
and you know at, at moments like tidbits of stories about sports tennis or other sports in general that i found kind of sad um at times like radicandi saying you know at moments i wish i never won the us open or um Nikolai Jokic, a uh, NBA player, is like, I really hope no one recognizes me after I stop playing basketball. I don't like this type of life. And I think it's a reminder that, you know, for, 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 for us people, it's like, yeah, we enjoy their tennis. We love them. We want to go watch them. But like respecting that, that they're a human being and, um, you know, tennis is a, is a tough sport, sport and you're going to lose probably more times than you win. And, and the glory is difficult to, to come by all the time and the pressure is really hard. So, um, I think a lot of people need to to chill it out on social media it's just uh, so many moments just goes overboard in an unnecessary and nasty way 100 percent agree yeah that's absolutely true uh staying within the apparel for a bit more uh mm -hmm. kostyuk my favorite dresser probably of this yeah. uh, tournament i told you that already on, via instagram i just yeah. it's a wilson dress right but yes. that whole collection yeah. looks spot on yeah, the their sportswear. I think over the last year, two years, with Kostyuk's kind of input has really nailed it, in my opinion. You know, it, five years ago, if you'd asked me if I'd wear Wilson, I'd be like, oh, definitely not. You know, that's a fuddy duddy old man brand, and they've completely done a U turn on that. And um, you know, kind of all credit to them. I think they're also just doing things that the other brands aren't doing and are totally capitalizing on the big sleepers of Nike and Adidas and, and kind of giving, I guess, what the people want, you know, it's like that, that colorway pink or purple is stuff we don't usually see with tennis. It's really nice to kind of have that, um, have that in there, especially for the guys. I, I love pink or purple on men. I think it looks really good. I also love that they are dressing their players in different, totally different styles, you know, because sticks in this kind of quite straight dress this time around. I think it's the tiebreaker tennis dress. And then you had like Alicia Parks in their winning tennis dress, which was, you know, more flowy type of style or Peyton Stance was wearing a different colorway with a top and skirt kind of combination. So I think they've um, made a really interesting play at the start of this year of, you know, picking up a couple more players that they're going to sponsor. They kind of picked uh, Kostyuk and um, Nicholas Jari is maybe their two kind of big bets. And then they have a lot of these smaller players who, um, you know, they're hoping probably one or two of them breaks through and, and starts kind of helping to grow their brand. They probably can't quite yet afford um, having too many top 20 players. And so um, I think we'll see an evolution of Wilson even more in terms of, you know, picking up full kit sponsorships with players over the next couple of years, because also, players look around and they're like, oh, geez, she looks good. I, I, like, I wouldn't mind having a deal with them that's, uh, you know, going to put me in a better situation. So I'm um, really curious to see what their kind of brand evolution is going to look like in the sport. And um, yeah, I think Kustik will continue to kind of be their, their brand face and probably probably the best dressed player along with a couple of others who are in Lululemon and, and those types of more stylish brands at the moment. Yeah, I agree. And I, yeah, it's it's, it's interesting that they bring in more of a like a 360 approach because I mean, Yonex they always want to get their players some full sponsorship. So hey, you're playing with Yonex rackets now, get the apparel. I was never very excited by the Yonex apparel about the Yonex apparel. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's anything that stands. I mean, the the dress for the women was pretty hideous. No, <laughs> I really don't like it. No, it's not yeah. for me. <laughs> it was a bit like a swirly ice cream uh, feeling, right? <laughs> Yeah, someone posted on uh, Twitter that it looked like an air freshener, like car air freshener, <laughs> which I just can't get out of my head. And um, yeah, it's sort of, in my mind, I, I think if you're a racket manufacturer and you want to get into sportswear, my opinion was always keep it simple and go for really nice silhouettes and go for good looking material um, and stay away from kind of doing crazy graphics. I, I really hated the Yonex kit at the US Open. It just it just bothered me in so many ways. And the fact that they wrote, you know, that inspiration was the energy and vibrancy of fruit and vegetables. I just can't, like, who in the brand strategy team thought that that was like, even if that was the inspiration, like maybe don't use that as the like product description on or collection description. Like it's not very appealing or doesn't have anything to do with tennis. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know kind of what their thought is, but for me, 
um yeah if, if if i was advising them i would go for high quality materials and and really simplistic but effective cuts and uh kind of try to have some variety maybe with your colors but not go for these kind of crazy graphics and i'm glad um you know nike learned the their feelings last year and did not do the same type of <laughs> crazy graphics again biddy bado is another brand i have to pick on i'm just like what are you what is this? Like, I just want to know, is it intentionally meant to kind of really be something out there that's like, oh my God, what is that? So you kind of look up the brand because it's totally different. Or do you want to try to go for the way of like, oh, wow, this player looks really good. And maybe that's the more nuanced eye that's paying attention to it. But I would think um, from what I've realized on my Instagram, more people care about how the players look on court than maybe we realize and also more people care about how they look on court than maybe we realize i i've totally felt like with tennis it's um a unique recreational sport in that way where people invest in the nice kit and the nice gear even if they're not you know the best player in the world and even if we make fun of them for for full kit wank or whatever you want to call it people buy people buy it people have the budget for it whereas you look at what people roll up or wear in the gym and it's like it looks terrible it's totally uncoordinated and most of the time they're like i don't care i'm at the gym so i think that's another kind of interesting insight that maybe is missing in in these ways of how do you make this kit not just look good on tv and on court but appealing to a general public or a mass market that in general as a sport with tennis people have the budget to spend so it's like the money's there it's just i don't know why why they uh can't deliver in terms of the the looks. Yeah, I don't understand at all. I think with Bidibadu, I never worn a Bidibadu uh, outfit, but I think it's it's really just, we're a small brand, I mean, mm-hmm. startup-ish, I, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. and, and they want to just throw as much color out there as possible, and hopefully it's something sticks to the wall. Uh, but I, I believe, as you, like, if, if someone looks good in something, if it's like suits a person, male, female, People will buy it like, oh, that looked good on Fuksovic or that looked mm-hmm. good on Sakari or whatever. You know, that's 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 yeah. that's what you need. You don't need it to look like, oh, there's some pink and we we just make whatever. You know, um, yeah. I, I think you try something with the colors, like you said, like okay, pink for men that could be really good looking depending on the shade of pink or whatever, mm-hmm. depending on what you like, of course. But it, it's like you can try things, but the cut needs to be good and the style yeah. and it needs to suit the person. I mean, yeah. that's pretty basic stuff, right? Exactly, and you feel like from over the years, there's enough insight to know what cut looks good or what silhouette looks good and what sells, right? Like, it's like we've had the perfect examples of what people like. So it's sort of um, the blueprint is there. And then, you know, you can take your own kind of creativity and your own brand's um, look and feel and kind of apply it to that template. And you would think that would yield good results, but it doesn't seem like that's the plan of action for the majority of these guys. (laughs) Yeah, I, I still think like people are nostalgic. I, I get like I have some mm-hmm. vintage kits like from a new manufacturer of like old Agassi kits, you know, like oh, the black cool. with the with the pink stripes and stuff. Mm-hmm. People still ask like, oh, where did you get that? You know, where did this? Mm-hmm. Because that still looks cool now, like eighties, yeah. nineties, twenty, like depending on what 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 year is from. But um, but there's very few asking any questions about modern kits. Like I don't get yeah. much conversation around that, or I don't see people rocking up in like a new Nike kit or a new Adidas kit that I'm like, Oh, you know? Yeah. yeah. And the only exception I've had with that is custom kits that have come for good players. Like, uh, and one of Naomi Osaka's red dresses that she wore for the Tokyo Olympics, that was kind of a limited run, a special dress to have. And I, and I love having it. And it's just, um, yeah, over the years, like fans or players kind of want to want to collect those types of, collections and also as you say like be able to go back in the archives and um sort of keep these things for a long time which again to me is why quality is so important you want people to kind of come back around and know like this is a dress that i can wear over and over again and love and continue to share that story and it it just feels like nowadays um yeah both the material and, and the quality of how the kits are made is just not the same as it was in the past yet the price point is just about the same if not more um, so from a consumer perspective, it's it's pretty frustrating at times. I mean, I know plenty of rec players that are going through tennis shoes once a month because they, you know, they play four or five days a week and they're shredded. And um, that that's definitely starts to add up. 
when you think about everything else that you're purchasing to to play your tennis as well it's um it starts to get pretty pricey from a gear perspective yeah it's an expensive sport you need to change your strings you need to have a bunch of rackets rackets are now 300 bucks you know each yeah. racket uh and then balls like balls run out like they quickly you know yeah so it's like it gets pretty pricey and then the clothes you need if you play like five times a week yeah you need to partly wash a lot i feel like a big environmental thief myself yeah uh, but it's like you wash a lot and you need a lot of kits because yeah. you're not washing you know every day so no. um i think it gets costly in that sense you know so it's quality is paramount especially yeah. after washes because like you see when you see like the nike yeah. logo starting to just fall off after Peel like off. one wash yeah. you're like hmm <laughs> this doesn't look great yeah i'm curious to know what have you, what have your thoughts been on the balls this year at the australian open i feel like we haven't heard quite so many as complaints as maybe we had last year and and you're the guy to ask <laughs> Yeah, it seems like I haven't thought so much about balls, which is good because lately the conversation has been a lot about like quality. I've even noticed it like I'm, you know, playing a lot. You take out some brands like I take out again. I'm like, it feel really jumpy, which they shouldn't mm -hmm. be this particular brand, like a Dunlop Fort. And then mm -hmm. like they die pretty quickly. You know, the durability mm -hmm. seems seems less good. Uh, but I think they maybe focused a bit more just like, OK, now we need to deal these guys because people, players are complaining. We're getting a lot of. Yeah of shit for this um so i i think people seem to be happy like it's mm -hmm. so common that players complain i mean partly it's the balls it's the courts generally the court speed can be slower mm -hmm. and then the you know everybody's playing polyester strings so that's put a lot of strain on the arm now yeah. a lot of players are trying like hybrids both on the men's and the mm -hmm. women's side so they have natural gut softens a little bit the impact you know uh so i don't think balls have been an issue which i think is good because i mean i i know atp put out a statement I, was it joined with the wta maybe that for the grand slams at least they were gonna or the season as such they were gonna try to improve so the consistency of what ball they use is, to, is more similar you know because now it's like yeah. every tournament you have a like a randomizer wheel where you go <laughs> we're gonna have this ball now <laughs> you know? yeah can i ask you is it um when you purchase like a, a dunlop ball and it has all the AO branding on it. Is it the same ball as what they're actually playing with at the tournament? Or are we getting something slightly different as the consumer? I think we're getting something very slightly different. I don't, I'm not sure in all cases, but I, I've okay. had experiences where uh, the, the tournament ball is, is a bit different from what you buy in the store. But it, it's mm -hmm. not like a huge difference, you know, but okay. it's a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, like, I, I usually recommend people to look for extra duty balls because, like, mm -hmm. the rubber really makes a difference like how quality rubber if you buy championship balls like balls with the name championship on them that means they are usually subpar rubber yeah and they're going to be less durable maybe more bouncy and it's going to be less fun to control the ball right so mm -hmm. uh, i think the balls make a big difference you know and that's also some like a really yeah. wear and tear because like you they don't last more than like i mean i play two hours and they're dead you know so it's like yeah 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 it's a huge they waste <laughs> yeah I huge know. waste in, in tennis yeah, really yeah, is. and also I was going to ask uh, more generally about, about players before we, we leave from the women's draw here. Um, so, Sakari, how, yeah. how will she get past uh, round one or round two in a Grand Slam? <laughs> Great question, a, yeah. Very good I, question, actually. <laughs> Palmy wonders whether maybe she needs a coaching change. Um, I feel like she's worked with the same coach now for more than five years, at least. And one starts to wonder if there's sort of a negative reinforcement that's kind of coming around with these with these Grand Slams. I thought we got a little bit of insight into it in that Netflix um, documentary where she was complaining about, you know, some tips that her coach was giving her that she sort of made light of, of like, oh, I'm playing Serena. And then she ended up kind of losing that match. And you sort of thought, what was that lack of communication about? I also watch that relationship a little bit in Cancun because I was sitting kind of close to the player's box and it was very it was often very negative between her and her coach of sort of like shut up and leave me alone and I don't you know I don't need to hear you and I, I don't know if that is a normal kind of thing for her or if that started developing over the last couple of years um I don't have that insight but I I just think sometimes you need to try something new if you continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. Um, it can really get you into a hole. I thought it was interesting that she switched her racket to the Wilson shift this year. Um, and that 
sort of technology change. I was curious if it was really going to be a boost, like we kind of saw when Medvedev changed his string setup and it really impacted his results on clay in a very positive way. So I was sort of wondering, like, I don't know, maybe this will be a switch up that is going to kind of put her on a good pedestal for the rest of the season. And I sort of thought in the warm up to the Australian Open that she looked pretty good at United Cup and she was playing some pretty strong tennis. And um, I, I feel like she's also maybe a very emotional player and a lot of these losses are getting to her and sort of creating this yeah, negative reinforcement that's making it hard to problem solve. So that's why I sort of wonder whether she might need a new, a new coaching setup and just completely change that, that background environment and see if that produces a different mindset. Yeah, I think I agree. I think it's sometimes you just need something new, whether it's you mm -hmm. just need a break, yeah. if you're mentally exhausted from competing. I mean, being on the tennis circuit, I mean, everybody yeah. should should understand that. It's like, it's just, it's not as glamorous as they think. You're traveling all over, you're staying in hotels and you're seeing practice courts, you're not seeing much else. Yeah. And uh, you can't have a drink because you're a professional athlete. I mean, you can mm -hmm. if you're public or whatever, but it's <laughs> like people are, are pretty uh, pretty pretty careful with, with yeah. uh, what they put into the body and, and so on, which they have to yeah. be in. So I, I think it, it's not maybe as exciting as it, it can seem, you know, and some people struggle more with it than others. Some people love it. Some people find it to be just their job and so on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that, um, again, like when we talk about sympathy or just kind of having understanding from a human being perspective, it's, it's really hard. Like I've thought about things like, geez, I really like my bed and my pillow a certain type of way. And every time I go home, I don't sleep well because I don't like my bed I have at home, you know? And it's um, to sort of think, yeah, every hotel you stay in is a different bed and a different pillow and a different night's sleep. And every, you know, country has a different type of food and diet. And it's hard, maybe hard to continue to kind of eat the same way that you're used to eating in all of these different countries. And um it's such an adjustment with the time difference. It's just so many factors when you're traveling the world in that way. But then you also sort of think there's a, a level of understanding and experience that you gain for that process as a player. And she's been through this a number of times. She's been on tour for long enough to sort of know the, the rhythm of it and maybe where she needs to take breaks in the season to make it, you know, um, possible to kind of have a good season overall or, you know, what she needs to do um, in and around tournaments to have a good tournament, you'd sort of think she would have a formula figured out by now as to, to kind of how to consistently show up and get good results. And I just don't know what's happening with the slam side of things um, where that's going awry. And maybe that tells me that it's, um, yeah, an issue with how she's preparing mentally for these tournaments. And um, because it, I just don't believe that it's got to do with her game specifically. I mean, she's she's a top 10 player for a reason. You know, she has the skill set to, to m at least make it to the second week. So it's just really no um, good explanation as to why she continues to lose early in these slams. No, I think a lot of tennis is mental, especially on this side. I mean, they're all very good at striking the ball left and right and, and do all the, the things they have to do on the court. But if, if you're yeah. mentally not there, um, I mean, we all know how tough it is to play tennis when you're not feeling it, right? So <laughs> it's one of those sports you're so connected always to your emotions, yeah. uh, which is why, you know, you have to let them out or keep them in whatever works and whatever floats your boat. Yeah. Uh, if we move a little bit to the menstrual, first, I want to make a fashion comment, which I always find interesting to talk about. <laughs> uh, does Adrian Manorino have a shirt sponsor or not? I don't think he does. Um, I don't think he does. And the, the, what would tell me he doesn't is that uh, if it was Lululemon that was sponsoring him, that there would be he wouldn't be in like Nike socks and he wouldn't be in, um, mm. you know, kind of pulling out all of this random stuff here and there. Of course, he might have Nike shoes uh, because Lulu doesn't have that. But um, yeah, if you look at the get up of what uh, Milos Raonic, for example, is wearing, he's an actual Lululemon sponsor versus what uh, Manorino is wearing. I think I'm not 100% sure, but I am pretty confident that that he doesn't have them as an official sponsor. Maybe he gets a little discount. I don't know. But um, yeah, it's he's just he just makes me laugh from so many aspects and how he approaches tennis. It's just totally refreshing and different. And I um fascinated by it i don't understand why he wouldn't be able to get a sponsor it's sort of like you are you know a top 30 player I, I don't believe that you can't i think it's 
literally just his preference like that's what he wants to wear and he doesn't care about i mean like look at what he wore at united cup he wasn't even wearing like team france colors he was still wearing whatever the hell it was he wanted to wear and i think that's also the same thread of you know he strings his rackets totally differently he doesn't know who his opponent is but now until an hour before a match he um just has such an unconventional approach that um <laughs> yeah I, I think he doesn't want a clothing sponsor and that's why he looks the way that he does <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that's my feeling too. He likes to cut of those t-shirts because he's yeah. had those t-shirts for I don't know how long, but it's like <laughs> different colors, just like different shades of very light colors. Yeah, there's nothing really exceptional going on there. No. And so Milos Raonic has has a sponsor then, is Lululemon. Yes, yeah, he's nearly with them. Yeah, because he looked like he was like going to a boat party after his match <laughs> <laughs> or something, you know. I know. Well, that is kind of the Lululemon like men's style, if you know All what right. I mean. It's like that very um kind of preppy yoga type of look <laughs> yeah it looked a bit funny because also he looks like he doesn't look like super fit for tennis i don't know yeah, sorry I know, I agree. but it's yeah. like it's like it did feel a bit like you know i'm having a pint after this and i'm going to the boat <laughs> you know whatever <laughs> like, also with the socks like the short socks and everything yeah it did look like he was not ready to play tennis it was more like in for for a short one you know yeah i agree and i think that's again an example of where like lulu isn't ready on the men's side and Again, maybe why there's more opportunities for these types of brands on the women's side to kind of have some breakthrough because there's more opportunity for creativity and style plus this sort of, um, you know, tennis skirt, tennis dress look has suddenly become an athleisure style as well. Um, and people are wearing that to the gym or they're wearing that running errands instead of wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And so I think like a Lulu has more opportunity to come up with interesting lines and really invest in the women's collection. And they've done a really good job with that. And they have women's players that they're sponsoring, but fewer men. And then the kits that they do have for the men is, it just feels very like, as you say, preppy or, um, you know, very much kind of not tennis gear. It's gear that was, you know, you can sweat in it. And so they sort of think, oh, it's fine, hand that one off. But uh, I think the look and feel of, you know, what you would want to see for a men's kit is different than, you know, what you're wearing on a gym t-shirt or gym shorts. And they've missed the mark on that. Yeah, 100%. Uh, before we leave the apparel, was was any kit standing out to you, like good looking on the men's side? I haven't really like paid that much. Like usually I see some, oh, I would, would want to buy that. Like, okay, I have a sponsor, but it's like still, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought the kit that Arthur Feast was wearing from Lacoste was good looking. I like that better than the Dimitrov, Medvedev and Djokovic kits. I, I liked the color combination. Um, I thought that the kind of whole get up from top to bottom was well coordinated. And I also think Lacoste did a good job of like, you know, not all of their athletes wear Lacoste shoes. And so they've kind of done a good job of, you know, working with an ASICS or somebody like that to make sure that the colorways kind of match and they're not wearing a shoe that kind of really throws off the whole outfit. So I thought they um, they did good work there. I also liked what Nicholas Jari was wearing from Wilson. Uh, it's a shame he didn't get any further. But again, I thought that was a, a you know, kind of well done, simplistic sportswear kit that just looked clean. Um, and would, you know, probably would have been more memorable if he, if he had had a better run. And um, those would be kind of the two that I would remember fondly. Um, <laughs> there's been some interesting kits on the men's side too. Did you see the, the koalas? The neon yeah, yeah the koalas. koala yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that was a bit funny actually that i mean that's i i do enjoy i'm not sure if it was good looking but it was like yeah at least you're doing something mm -hmm. that says something right like that has a message that that is yeah. just fun and playful like instead yeah. of just always going for the same you know some some outfits are so boring i don't even know how they come up with them like i feel like they, they there has been many good looking male kits as well through history mm -hmm. so there should be like some kind of border template something right where you're yeah. like okay we should do it something like this but it feels yeah. like they yeah they're running out of ideas a little bit <laughs> yeah but it's I, I agree with you like it's um again that sort of strategy of like do you want to shock people with something completely different out there and wild that's gonna you know get someone to look up what you have 
And is that a leeway into leading them into a different collection that maybe is a little bit more, um, you know, wearable for the general public? I, I think that that kind of shock tactic is interesting. Um, and it certainly got people's attention. And that's, a, you know, um, that's a, a good sign for them as a brand. I'm sure they've generated some impressions over this past week that uh, they wouldn't have if they'd gone for a, a plain black T-shirt. So um, maybe there's something to learn there in terms of, um, you know, how do you lead people into the sales funnel in a space where it's so crowded and, um, you know, there's so much competition. Yeah, true, true. Um, Andy Murray, your countryman, uh, almost. Uh, what do you think? Should he retire? Should he keep on going? Uh, it's not ours to say, but yeah. uh, what, what was your feeling after? It was a little bit sad because he, he did look very dejected himself. He didn't look like his normal fighting self, right? It was sad, yeah. I mean, I think, honestly, um, my appreciation and love of Andy Murray really grew after I watched his documentary on Amazon about his journey with his hip and how he you know, I think is so relatable for the general kind of tennis audience or, you know, folks that play tennis in the way of, you know, I know I'm not as good as I used to be and I'm not going to win grand slams and, um, you know, kind of all of these things, but I still love being out here. I still love training. I still love competing. And I think, you know, sometimes an athlete, we want an athlete to go out on a high on the absolute pinnacle of their career like a Sampras does, but that's not, um, I think for a lot of players, that's not easy to do. And it's hard to say goodbye to, you know, to, to the sport and what they love doing. And um, I think for him, if he's still having a good time and enjoying himself, then he'll hang around. But I think also some of that love and enjoyment might, um, might dwindle if he continues to kind of have results like this that he finds very disappointing and, and that the work isn't really kind of paying off at least to get, get through a couple rounds at a slam or at a big tournament. So I wouldn't be too surprised if, um, if we're heading into his sunsetting days. Um, but, you know, I think he's still a great ambassador for the sport and, you know, kind of does a lot for British tennis as well. So a lot of us are hoping he'll, um, hang on for, for a little while yeah if he's healthy i i think so i mean the the way roger ended was kind of sad in a way as well because he yeah. it was just clear that his knees were done right so yeah. uh, it was a bit like when Mari first retired he was like okay i can't keep doing this anymore and then you have to just applaud a guy that says okay i'm gonna go through surgery like years of you know recovery just to mm -hmm. get back and grind on the tour which he doesn't financially need at all and he has yeah. kids at home and whatnot so he, he loves the sport, and I think it's pretty cool. So he's one of my favorites uh, as well. And uh, I, I think it's good to have a role model like that who is really... Uh, he's also quite active on tennis Twitter, one of the best Twitter uh, Twitterers, uh, Xers, whatever you call it today. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I, I think he's just a good advocate for the sport. Um, you know, like, I would love to see him still involved from like a player council perspective or an ATP board perspective. I mean, he would be the type of person that I would trust to have, you know, a sound opinion on what's going on with Zverev and kind of how to handle that type of situation. If you wanted to have some player representatives um, kind of involved in disciplinary hearings or processes in that way, I think he would, um, he would bring a fair and kind of composed approach in to, to, to that type of role. And I think he will continue to give back to the sport, even off the court. I know he does a lot with the Lawn Tennis Association. He does a lot with British players and, and helping them come up. And I think he also has been a really good advocate for the women's game. I mean, on countless times throughout his career, he's stood up for women's tennis and women's players and, you know, the kind of famous uh, press interview he had at Wimbledon one year where he talked about um, you know, he's he's uh, kind of gave a shout out to Serena Williams and made sure that she wasn't forgotten in kind of the history and narrative of, of Wimbledon and tennis. And so, um, yeah, he's just a really great character that honestly, I've learned to love more over the years. I think when I was when he was young and um, in his prime and, and winning Wimbledon, he was maybe a little bit more divisive amongst the um, UK crowd. And not everybody loved his sort of on court demeanor, especially because it was so um different from from the fan favorite of a roger so 
yeah, I think he's endeared himself to the to the British public even more over the last few years just because his efforts have been so so valiant at times. Yeah, I think so. I think he's a great role model. And, and uh, you know, even had that moment with Mira Andreeva where I think yeah. someone tweet, like said, you know, oh, she might need to work on her mental strength. And then she came back from like 1-5. Yeah. And he, yeah. you know, he defended her and, and she, you know, he was kind of a hero to her. He's kind of a hero to her. So I think that was, was a nice, like, bromance or whatever you want to call it, you know, between between like two generations and also the two two genders. So it's like really cool that he he is connected to also women's tennis and not only yeah. staying in the main lane, which is pretty common otherwise. Yeah, yeah. I would like to see a little bit more crossover like that. I think, um, you know, the more... I think there's advocates like for both sides of the game and we're seeing just in general in terms of the trajectory of women's sports is just on the up and up and it's going to continue to grow and i think that you know these tournaments where they we are playing in the same venue and it's it's the same prize money um it, i would love to see more kind of combinations of, of mixed doubles teams teaming up and yeah more relationships of kind of support and um interest in the women's game um, from the men's side and kind of vice versa, because I don't think we get a lot of that that crossover, which would be nice. I think it was within one organization, it would help a lot. Like, I think that one of the issues, yeah. um, I think players are or can be quite open to it, but it's like it's ATP and WTA are two different organizations, which yeah. is, uh, I think, hurting the sport quite, you know, in a big way. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, I think it's, it's easy to underestimate how, how weird that gets when you're like, okay, then prize money would be easier, then everything would be easier because you right. have like one and and there would be more joint events, which is better for everyone, right? So, yeah. and probably less travel. So if you could like arrange the trend, tennis season, so it's more like now we're in this part of the world, then we go to this part of the world and there's like, you know, 20 events here, then 20 events, instead of just like everybody's flying all over all the time yeah. and it, it gets difficult. It's also good for the environment, I guess. And, and you know, all these things that are not so, yeah. so yeah, good. Yeah, it would be easier, easier to try to, planes and kind of try to figure out transportation for players and look after everyone. I, I know there's a lot of negative conversation around a merger happening. And to be honest with you, I don't know how I'm optimistic to feel about that. Even as a, as a prospect, I have no idea um, if that is even something that really could happen, but I think ATP and WTA are working towards the same goals in terms of what they're trying to provide their players and, how they, you know, kind of long term want to to look at this sport evolving, and I agree with you. I feel like the best way to do that would be to come together and think of it in a in a holistic way, and um, that that would be the ultimate goal. And it, it just feels like there's a lot of resistance towards towards doing that. And um, yeah, I'm I'm curious what those conversations even look like behind closed doors. Yeah, I am very curious about that as well. Um, before we go into your picks for the men's draw, uh, one of my favorite Will Guys players, I think he's he's a, he's a good ambassador for sports. He's like a really nice guy, Matteo Berrettini. He's been struggling with injuries now for so long, like and yeah. it really like you feel for him, you know, because yeah. it's like oh, this is now this is a foot, then this is this, then it's that, and uh, he must be going having a hard time. You know, I saw him leaving the court crying when I was went to Stuttgart last um, oh. year, and uh, because you know he, his body is just breaking down. And he has a relationship with Boss, which has also kind of stepped up their clothing game, I think. Uh, do they have a player on the women's side as well, right? Yes. Uh, the girl who lost to Savalenka in the first round, Seidler, Seidler. Oh, yeah, and that was yeah. not the best looking Boss kid we've ever seen. Was that the no, thing? I think you posted not. about that, right? <laughs> yeah, she did not look great. Uh, she didn't get positive reception, which... which uh, surprised me from boss because i know they do other kind of athletic gear for other sports um and i don't know whether they, they just like took the men's template and was like make this a skirt and a top or kind of what the approach was but um yeah that did not look good <laughs> no and if you're stepping in like such a major brand like with long history like you're stepping into to a new sport and you want to like okay we bring better team a good looking guy yeah nice kids overall they need to be able to also like really think through their strategy on the women's side as well. Like they can't just be like, Oh, here we go. <laughs> Good luck. The intern handled it, you know? Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, again, you never know if you get a, a lucky draw where your player, even if they're not a top ranked player is playing the world number one or the defending champion in the first round or two, there's going to be eyeballs on the match and that's great, you know, impressions and exposure. And, um, 
yeah, of course, the conversation kicked off about how bad she looked, which is, um, you know, not, not a good start for the boss kind of women's tennis collection. Um, but, you know, for, for Berrettini, they've done a really good job with him. I, I also think they've done a good job in collaborating with E6 to, to kind of align the shoes with their collections and um, telling a kind of good performance story there. So I think they've approached it the right way. It's just uh, unfortunate the execution for the women's was... Um, what it was <laughs> yeah, yeah and these things get more attention partly thanks to you but it's also like people like you say which is interesting people care more about the apparel because it's it's like what i was shocked when i started working with rackets or testing rackets and doing that on a more professional level like um that people are so interested i mean it's because they are also using partly it's what you watch on tv but it's also when you go and play your sport you're using the balls you're using the rackets you're using the gear and the shoes that is available and then you want to, you know, oh, that looks great. That is kind of my personality. I like this guy or girl. Mm -hmm. And then I want to be more like them. Mm -hmm. And then you need the gear to be good, and look good and feel good and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's one of very few sports in that way that people consume on, on a mass market where we do pay attention to personal style and, and what people are wearing because every other sport, they're in a uniform and, um, you know, you're not copying that. You're wearing that to support the team from a merchandise perspective. So, um, yeah, it, uh, it definitely kind of surprises me how it, it feels like there's so, yeah, lack of effort, lack of attention, uh, good designs. And, and when we know tennis is a sport that if you're playing a lot, you have budget to spend. Um, and, uh, you know, every year people are buying at least one new kit or one new racket or something new is added to their gear. So, there's, these are the four moments in the calendar year where you really have a chance to, to catch attention and to sell your product. And um, you just would think that they would do everything they can to make sure that it's as appealing as possible. Yeah, I agree. I, there's, a, there's a chance there for sure in that market. Uh, looking at the men's draw, I mean, there's no not been that many surprises on the men's side, I would say. Um, I what was What has surprised you? Is there anything that kind of took you a little bit back and said okay you know i didn't see this coming you know we have no novak is moving through the draw uh, not without problems but still uh yeah. was he your favorite or did you have any other predictions ahead of the event no novak was was my favorite and i just feel like it's hard to bet against a guy who's you know won here 10 times and just knowing you know kind of how he how he is um especially down under i think he's the one to be um Talking about predictions, when I was kind of thinking about who might have an early exit, I was worried about Taylor Fritz. And so he's surprised me a little bit that he's made it here um, to the quarters for the first time. He's beaten the top 10 player in a grand slam for the first time. I think he played tactically a really smart match last night. Um, just totally exposed the tits of pass backhand. He served really well. Um, his first up percentage was super high and I think he kind of found a, a mental zone which was working for him. I think at moments in the past, you know, he sort of looks like he's really on the verge of like panicking and, and very stressed. So um, I think he played a really good match against Tsitsipas and obviously I don't feel particularly hopeful for him against Djokovic, but um, I was surprised that um, that he got that win and... Um, I, I wasn't expecting a good run from him this this tournament. No, he kind of flew under my radar as well. I didn't think about him at all. I think it's been a bit quiet, maybe since the yeah. US Open. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and then some players, you just, okay, you don't think about them, then they pop up out of nowhere. And because yeah. and, the level is obviously there, but it's about like the mental state and the draw. And his draw here has been pretty good. Like uh, yeah. Diaz Acosta, Gaston, okay, Marochan, pretty good player. And Tsitsipas, uh, not maybe in his top form like last year. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, yeah, against Djokovic, it looks pretty tough. But we will say that yeah. about anyone in the yeah, in the whole the whole true. draw, pretty much. What do you think? Uh, of what do you think Tsitsipas? about Rublev? Sorry, don't mean to cut you off. <laughs> no, I was no, curious no. to ask you about what you think of Tsitsipas tinkering with his service motion in mid match. We saw it again last night, where like all of a sudden on break point, he went from a platform to a pinpoint. And it was just like variety in the match itself. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does strike me as some kind of madness to keep tinkering like during matches. I mean, it's something, yeah. you know, I do uh, because I play with 16 different rackets in a yeah. you know, you know, week. 
but it's uh, it's not something you'd advise a pro. I do like his that he's very open minded. I mean, knowing him a bit, you know, from from having dinner with him and so on, like I do know that he's a very astute reader of the game. He always thinks about the game. He's always trying to improve and figure things out. Uh, but maybe he would need sometimes like advice on like how to implement these things and how yeah. to go about them. You know, I think that would help. But uh, but I know it comes from a place where he's like, how can I get more of this? How can I get more comfort, more power out of the gear or or uh, my stance? But yeah, I've never seen that before that someone just takes that and starts like, OK, serve stance, you know, that's yeah. uh, now I'll try this. Um, so I, I thought I thought it was very surprising. Uh, but, you know, I was also impressed that he managed to stand like after playing such a bad set, which he did with the new stance, just okay, I'll I'll drop it and then he won, you know. So that yeah. was that was good at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, I was totally took me by surprise too because I think everyone initially thought, oh, maybe it's because of his back that he's sort of like you know trying something a little different, and then he was like, no, it's just like what all the big servers do. So I was tr trying it out, and you just sort of think like, as you say, like good for you for kind of being open minded and trying new stuff, even being a little bit older, but like. It just seems crazy to be doing that in the middle of a match um, on break points, on important moments. And it just, uh, you sort of wonder, like, are you in a good place, like, mentally? Or, like, who's telling you to do that? It's just strange to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've never never seen it. I think I think it's, it's uh, yeah. Well, I don't think we'll see it again. I think he's probably going to go back to his, unless there's a problem, like, okay, if there's a yeah. physical problem, you have to make changes, is one thing. Yeah. But I think these pros are so good. Like, I, I mean, I've said it several times, but it's like a lot of the things are mental. Like, so if you're not, you know, feeling yourself, you're not confident, it, it's, it's maybe that small technical change is not really going to make a difference. It's not like he has a bad serve. He has an amazing yeah. serve, right? Yeah. So, exactly. um, yeah, it did, did strike me as very surprising uh, as well, you know. And yes, and and because generally there are very situations where, you know, they bring a new racket, like Murray tried a new racket for a while. And then the coach, Ivan Lendl in this case, tell, maybe tells him like, hey, you know, you should go back to your old racket. You don't need to start tinkering here. And yeah. in some cases it helps to tinker a bit, but this was kind of a drastic non-gear change. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think everybody had something to talk about for a bit, at least. That's that's, that's probably good. It's good PR. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because he was he had such a good um, win rate percentage behind his serve last year. I didn't even think he was someone that like really had to work on that. If anything, I would have been like focus on fixing your backhand. It's uh, <laughs> much more uh, important than than what's going on with your serve. But teach Saren. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's tough with the one handed backhand. It doesn't yeah. like. Um, Playing with the one hand back on yourself, you're feeling like, oh, but oh no, there's no one here now. Like if we look at the draw now, I don't think there's any. I mean, the men's side for sure, there's no one player with the one hand back and left now. The Dimitro yeah. and yeah. Sitsipas are both out. Out. Women's side, they had um, in Paris. She lost to uh, superstar Andreeva, I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, she has a very nice one hand back end. And then there was Golubic, who has yes. a one hand back end. Yeah. You know, yeah. but but otherwise, there's not a lot of one handers. It's it's, no. it's an easy target, sadly. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you, with shop or whatever, you, you see it that it's like kind of breaks down you yeah. know, over, over time. So I'm not surprised not to see them. Uh, but yeah, what do you think of Alcaraz? Should he hit sleeveless or sleeves, first of all? <laughs> I like the sleeveless look. I mean, he has a, he has the physique to wear it. Um, so why not? I think I think the tennis purists or tennis traditionalists, you know, don't want to see the sleeveless approach. And I know that Shelton got a lot of, you know, hate for it last year. Um, and people seem to have kind of similar feelings about what Alcaraz is wearing and they don't love that. But um, it was something that Nadal used to wear and then kind of put that aside, not entirely sure why. Um, but again, I'm just, I'm a fan of doing things differently. I'm a fan of having a different uh, personal style and kind of look and feel and sleeveless does not offend me so <laughs> um yeah i i appreciate the look and um i think it i think he rocks it <laughs> yeah for i mean it it looks great on him and i think also it, it's uh, like i said i think it, tennis has a marketing opportunity in, in and we've talked about this before about like really en embracing the individualistic you know part of the sport like oh you, i'm this personality Go out there, be aggressive, be a bit aggro, uh, wear your stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that's why, I mean, guys like Kyrgios has such a big following. It's it's yeah. not because he's he always he sometimes loses his mind and, you know, breaks rackets. It's also because he 
plays it differently. Comes in a, like a basketball jersey with a T-shirt underneath, yeah, and a ba- basketball cap, and he's playing tennis differently, you know, and yeah. that people really like that instead of yeah. everybody looking more similar. So I think tennis could do a lot more to kind of yeah, 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 wear something different. The clo- the the sponsors coming in, hey, you know, we wanted you to look a bit more like this and and push it a bit and i think definitely sleeveless is is not something that should be <laughs> i mean you need to really be like an eight year old in a country club to be like oh sleeveless is not on yeah. like i mean i i don't think sleeveless looks good on Sverev, for example but i no. think it looks great on alcaraz so it depends you know yeah and that's why you know you gotta design for physique and know your personal style and um you know the short shorts look good on runa but don't look good on other guys and the long shorts on Azverev I don't think look good on Aruna so you know it's like having variety um having different styles is important you know we talked about okay there's sort of a, a silhouette a template of of tennis looks that we know works with the general public that people appreciate and love and is sort of your classic or your staple but when you think about I don't know a wardrobe in general you have your your classic looks and your you know your blue jeans and whatever and then you have the occasional party dress or you know different top that you crack out for a certain occasion and certainly a grand slam is a is a reason to do something a little different and have your own style or your own look so um yeah i i don't have any problem with that at all (laughs) so what do you think of uh cameron nori your uh countryman what he's gonna do he has a chance yeah, uh, uh, I want him to have a chance, but I don't know. Um, you know, he had such a good start to his year last season, and I think he, you know, really surprised a lot of us and kind of got himself inside that top 15, knocking on the door for top 10, and was, yeah, I mean, playing some really impressive tennis. And then second half of the year just totally dropped off and really didn't bring the same level and didn't seem like the same type of player. So, I'm wondering if it, this is another good start to the season, if he can capitalize on that. Maybe he worked on some things during the offseason. I'm not sure. But um, in terms of just general with him as a player, I've never found him super entertaining. Um, I find him to be a little bit robotic on, on the baseline and quite kind of mechanical in the way that he hits his shots. I find, I find his backhand so just like, jarring it's just the elbows are so straight i am confused by the mechanics of it but um you know it it works for him and he he finally turned that head to head around against casper Ruud. so you know maybe he's in a positive mindset to push Zverev, and Zverev has been pushed already this tournament so um i'm hopeful but then again i think uh, you know a lot of pundits have been saying that Zverev is a dark horse and um, when it comes to his game, I don't, you know, I don't disagree. I think he's playing some really good tennis and is looking like a dangerous competitor, um, you know, at this point in time. And so uh, would would have been someone early on that I'd pick to, to make a deep run here at the AO. Do you think how much does like uh, court cases and uh, allegations, you know, inflict on him like mentally? Do you think it doesn't seem to affect him much on the tennis court, at least? That's my feeling. Yeah, it doesn't seem to affect him too much. I'm sure he has, you know, his his structure and his routines in his camp that keep the noise of that down as much as possible. Obviously, I think there's been more attention and more questions in particular this week as it, you know, relates to the Breakpoint episode and the court case, the date for that being set. And, um, you know, you can just see by the way that he answers the questions that he, um, you know, totally... Uh, maintains his innocence and doesn't think he's done anything wrong and doesn't kind of want to um, even kind of get into that topic. So, you know, fair enough, he protects himself from the sport. And no matter the outcome of the case and kind of, you know, what happens with that, I think the one the one piece where I would just say there was a, a bit of a missed trick, not just from him, but other ATP players who were asked the same questions about, Um, his case and kind of what was going on was just in general like an opportunity to have a little bit of a nod towards hey you know I don't know what's going on with Zverev specifically but in general I condemn domestic abuse and here are resources or you know a, a, a helpline or whatever to point to in case you are someone that's a victim of this or um expressing some sympathy for folks who have been a victim of domestic abuse and kind of trying to 
have a little bit of balance of like, yes, it's a sensitive, in some ways, political issue. Um, and it's your fellow, you know, colleague in that way. And so you don't want to pass judgment. And I don't think it's appropriate to pass judgment. But I do think it's appropriate to recognize that it's a very difficult, sensitive conversation that it, you know, warrants at least some recognition of how serious that is and how important it is to protect those who, you know, who have been victims of, of domestic abuse. And that doesn't have to do with whether he's guilty or not. It just has to do with the fact that that's a part of the conversation and it can be very triggering and it can be um, really important for these these folks who are in the limelight to set an example um, and and kind of draw a line in the sand on that. That's a very good point. I think that was an opportunity. Uh, I, I think some some PR training sometimes is missing yeah. from from the players. I think that could be like having worked with like athletes on like sponsorship mm -hmm. things I did in my my past career. I, I think yeah. sometimes you need to train. I mean, they they know like they know how to play tennis. When tennis matches go to the gym, and they do, they're all about performance. Mm -hmm. But as a media team, or as having like some uh, like kind of legal advisor or someone just like PR guy, say, hey, this type of sponsor this is the type of like you bring out your personality be more of a role model for this type that fits them also as a person i think is good because otherwise it gets a little bit robotic even with the press conferences you know if you've gone to a number of them and i've been to many uh, it's that sometimes they, they the questions are pretty stupid often from the press sadly like yeah. you you sit there and you're like how can you ask this question it's like a, what is this you know yeah. do you have are you why do you belong here in this room yeah. you know so but but also then to be, and that's maybe why they kind of shield themselves, but also to to try to have that conversation a bit more, get to know the player, for them to get, for the fans to get to know them, you need to be a little bit more open and, and be a little bit more vocal about stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's, I guess it's accepting that responsibility of, of kind of being a public presence and that your voice and your opinion and the way that you conduct yourself matters. And in particular for players that, have a big platform. If you're on the ATP Players Council, like a Dimitrov, you know, he's a globally loved player and person, and he's known to kind of be that type of nice guy. And for him to kind of say, oh, I, you know, first I've heard of this, I have no idea, and I'm never on social media, and I never look at the news, it's sort of like, really, dude? Like, this has been kind of unfolding for quite some time. And even if that that was the case sort of, yeah, having a bit of nuance and, and tactfulness in the sense of like, oh yeah, if I, if, if he really hasn't heard of it again, trying to find a way to um, at least draw a line in terms of what he finds acceptable and doesn't find acceptable. And of course, trying to do that in a way without passing judgment can feel stressful from a player's perspective. But I think that's really where the agent comes in and, and should be providing value and guidance as to how to handle that type of of scenario and maybe they caught a couple of these players off guard and the agent didn't prep them for that but as soon as these questions were in press those conversations with those agents should have been happening it's like okay if you get asked this question how are you going to answer it and people are looking to you to kind of um to set an example especially with with a story like this yeah, it's a good opportunity also to show like your values, you know. And yeah. I think like the, partly what Mario has been doing well is that he's he's never been shying away from this type of conversations, you know. Yeah. While while a lot of tennis players, obviously, like like you said, it's a locker room thing, you know. You don't want to be in any kind of feud with anyone or talk about anyone. But they, in this case, they don't even need to do that. They just need to take yeah. like a more of a you know open stance, which is not like a complicated political issue because everybody is should be against <laughs> any kind of yeah. domestic abuse, whether men or females. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of a missed opportunity. And there was some um, some blow up from like the the break point episode. I, I did I have not watched uh, mm. in all uh, honesty here at uh, the second part or the second season is the mm. first season, second release, whatever. Mm. Um, have you watched it or no? Yes. Yeah, I did watch it. And, and the blow up was kind of like, OK, uh, Medvedev looked a bit like a villain and Zverev looked like he's an awesome guy and do a high five. Uh, was that your feeling as well? Or because I haven't watched it, I have to ask you kind of <laughs> from my ignorance. Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, it felt it felt like a, a PR episode in some ways. And you could see if you want to kind of, you know, 
the storytelling aspect of it from a TV perspective was this guy has come back from a major injury um, and, you know, worked his way back inside the top 10. That's that in itself on paper is a great story. I think to me, what bothered a lot of people was, you know, if you compare that episode to episodes with Curios, where they purposely kind of leaned in on, you know, bad boy of tennis, and they kind of tried to explore, you know, that side of him and then give color as to who he really is and, and what he's about. But there was no kind of glossing over the the bad stuff. And there was mention of, you know, stuff going off on off court that was, um, you know, being dealt with. And I also think the way that Kyrgios handled that in press conferences was much less abrasive. He, he, he was always like, look, guys, I, I want to talk about it, but I can't. It's in court. It didn't come across as like, hey, why are you asking me these questions? I'm really offended that you would even ask me. Um so I think he he handled that better. And then and Netflix also told more of a what felt like more of a truthful story. Um, whereas with Zverev's episode, you know, to 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 have absolutely no mention of it when I've seen um like a documentary about Zverev on German TV where it did include some mentions of of kind of what was going on and it can be weaved in in so many different ways, right? It doesn't have to come from him in specifically like what i noticed in this series was they didn't have a uh, kelly um i forget her last name but uh, that kind of wta uh, journalist or correspondent kind of narrating some of the episodes and they lost i guess some of the ability to have context and, and color outside of what the player was offering and yeah maybe they netflix felt like oh geez like this is an unresolved case and like do we really need to um shine a light on that but to not to not shine a light on it feels like you're covering something up so I think it's always better to have the conversation and at least um make that known and um yeah I think the whole antics about Medvedev was also sort of a a, a strange take it was like you know uh some of Zverev's on-court behavior in the past has also been totally unacceptable um, and it's not like he is a stellar example of how you should behave. And in particular, they were highlighting that match. I think it was in Rome where, you know, Medvedev pulled the net stick out and Medvedev, you know, went for a bathroom break in between um, games. And Zverev was complaining about, you know, this really threw me off. And it's like, but after he came back from the toilet break, you broke and held sub. It wasn't until later that set that you actually lost it okay so don't tell me that the bathroom break that you broke and hold serve after was what mentally threw you off so i just felt like he in general always looks for someone else to point the finger at and doesn't always have a good way of of accepting his own behavior and his own responsibility and funnily enough the only person in that episode who was like it's not medvedev's fault was his girlfriend who i think is also his psychologist um I could be wrong there, but yeah, it's uh, it was sort of just a strange dynamic. And um, I think Gil Gross did a good episode where he talked about this for like 40 minutes. But um, yeah, it it felt like a PR sort of whitewash. And um, I can understand why a lot of fans were, were put off by that or watched that episode and then looked Zverev up and kind of knew more about him and was sort of like, hey, eh? like, why wouldn't you have included that context? Yeah, it's it's interesting because I, I can understand from a storytelling point of view, like, okay, we want this, you know, usually they simplify it to be like, okay, we want to have only one theme, the comeback king, you know, he's coming mm. back from injury. That's the only narrative we want in this episode. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe it's very, have good, has good lawyers potentially that also want to help out uh, directing yeah. episodes. But uh, I th I think it's like they, they, the simplification is sometimes hurting the story o overall because like you, you're going to have to omit certain things, but then certain things are very big things to omit. So it's just like tricky, tricky. Yeah, uh, I do get it. I, I will watch it. But uh, yeah, I was it, it's a sign that you were not so convinced by the first edition that you're like, oh, I have to watch this now, you know, but it's it's uh, yeah. it's interesting. I think the topic. other thing that that bothered me, even in season one, but in particular in this season was the and I'm sure you've seen videos about this was the editing and the, like the tennis itself. I just don't yeah. think they do a good job of making tennis 
look good. Like you never saw one point played out from start to finish from one angle. You know, they're always chopping to one baseline to the next baseline. It's a strange angle. You don't see where the shot's going. Then sometimes the way they've edited it together, it's like Sabalenka serving on the on the do side and then they pan out and she's standing on the ad side and then it's going to Rebecca in his backhand, but they show her hitting a forehand. So it's just um, like the clips don't line up and, you know, for, for a tennis documentary to me, first and foremost, tennis needs to look good. And I don't think they've done a good job of making the tennis look good in the way that they did with drive to survive and with full swing where the sport really came through and you could appreciate how difficult the sport is itself. I don't think we get that in, in break point. I think that's a great point, actually. Not a break point. It's a great point. Okay. Because uh, I think it's like really important that you show, like I, I usually struggle with like the super high angles on TV, like where mm -hmm. they it looks like everyone can play tennis. And that's yeah. why like half of the American population think they can take points out of <laughs> ATP pros or whatever it is, according to stats. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because it's like, it looks so slow, oh, but I can also play at this pace. But they have a golden opportunity to show the power of the players on both the men's and the women's tour, the physicality they have to move with side to side, but also then you have to show like how high the ball is bouncing with the spin of the shots, like how fast it, it's really moving. So you could put like a lot of effort on like camera angle, very, you know, mm -hmm. court level. And instead they just try to make it up. Like it looks like a video game and <laughs> animation. It's not really, I think, I think it's, it's like short selling the sport and that's not the point of the whole thing. So they, they could actually just have that as a, like a nice bonus. How do we package tennis? So tennis looks as sexy as possible as a sport. Yeah. That's it. You know, Totally. Can't be that hard. <laughs> it can't be that hard. I don't know. I don't know who's editing, but uh, yeah, it's not It's not as good as it should be, that's for sure. It's probably not a tennis player, sadly, no. so that's the thing. Like, you, you need to have, like, a proper tennis advisor. I mean, probably they have some, I guess, but you need to really focus on, like, okay, what are we doing here? The sport needs to come across as genuine because, I mean, I've watched the golf one as well, uh, not being, like, a golf fan of any kind, but, I like, I was, like, engrossed because I'm like, oh, wow, it's, the guys behind this the sport are really interesting. One guy has this, he writes down every shot. One yeah. guy is an absolute playboy with a mansion. You know, it's, it was interesting, you know? Yeah, I agree. Uh, got me hooked on my my flights. It's a good flight time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Entertainment. So what is waiting for you now in your um, life as uh, it's in Eliza's world? What, what is like, what are you working on? What's uh, you just doing a lot of content, of course, but you're doing more partnerships, more brand deals. Yeah. What, what's yeah. going on? Uh, yeah. More, more partnerships and brand deals to come. Um, hopefully getting the chance to team up, team up with some more kind of media um, opportunities. And honestly, I'm trying to speak into existence um, on the event side of things and hosting and emceeing and really getting to connect with the tennis community before these kind of big grand slams and kind of being present at those activations and helping brands kind of translate their, their strategy and to connect with the fans on a more, you know, kind of personal level. and in a way that feels like a lot of fun and, and telling those stories. So I'm really excited about some of those opportunities to, to work with some brands that I think are doing a really good job, um, you know, with, with their approach to tennis this year and also with some media companies that I think um, talk about the culture of tennis in a way that I love, like Racket, Racket Mag um, does such an awesome job of, of exploring the culture of tennis and kind of, um, approaching it that way and I think for me my most important like core value is that tennis feels um, from my end approachable and accessible to everyone that it's not kind of got this like exclusive country club feel to it of like you need to watch to know and understand my content I try to to make it um, so that it, it satisfies both the tennis nerd and the tennis uh, newbie and um, yeah just try to connect with others who really love the sport in as many ways as possible and hopefully do that in person as much as I can. Awesome. Yeah. So we'll see you at more events. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. uh, you went to the Cancun one and I have to ask about that before we drop off. Yeah. Um, how was that? Because that got some so-so PR and it did look, I did see some funny bounces. That's one thing. <laughs> Yeah, that tournament was uh, was chaos, and I think they know it. Um, they knew they were in the middle of a PR crisis, and and were trying so hard to keep a lid on it. 
I think, um, you know, the, the, it's known like the court itself wasn't great. The conditions were awful that week. So much rain, so much wind. Um, the practice courts weren't available. Everything was so last minute. Um, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't need to hammer the nail in even more than I already have for them. But I think my biggest takeaway from the tournament was not just from my own perspective, but listening to folks like an Avratilova or Chris Eva is like, this can't happen again. And, you know, we already kind of had it in, in Fort Worth, Texas, the prior year that we had it in Cancun. And I'm personally very concerned that we're in 2024 already and we don't have a location for, for where the WTA finals are going to be. And the reason being is that promotion, planning, getting fans to come to an event, you need to give people a year. You, you really do. Um, it's so vital for the lead up to the event and building the type of environment that's worthy of a WTA final setting to build up the marketing and kind of all of the storytelling that's supposed to go along with that throughout the years. You know, we always talk about the race to Turin even now, you know, and so that is super concerning to me and makes me worry about did you learn your lesson in the right way over the last two years and i know that there's speculation about going to saudi and how they want to package that and get that done and concerns with money and steve simon stepped down and um or you know kind of in a different role so it still feels like it's a mess and it still feels like we're headed towards another type of you know a uh, last minute scenario which um I think is just going to kind of continue to make the WTA look bad and uh, aggravate the players. So I'm concerned about that. Yeah, that's another event that I really thought could benefit from like being played by in the same play. I, I know the calendars yeah. end in a different times, but to have a joint like now, because we, we only have eight players, like so it's not that you need a, like a huge venue or or the, the scheduling is difficult. You could easily have a male and a female tour and a doubles tournament there. You yeah. know, both it, it would not be a problem. So it's like it feels another missed opportunity, in my opinion, uh, because the slams are what makes the year. Like it's what excites me. I, I think like the that's what you see the traffic to the website to the YouTube channels is is, is interesting in Instagram. So you need these big events, and that's I'm counting the finals to one of the yeah. big events. Like we have the slams, we have Indian Wells, pretty big event, the Masters or the thousands, and the final need to also be treated like such but if, if you have you know the the women's event being counted as some kind of like oh let's make it up as we go you know it, it's not gonna work you know so i think it would be much easier to combine it if we can do it with the thousands we can probably do it with that one as well so i, I really strange to me the whole 100%. situation also yeah. yeah sorry no go ahead also like the, the steve simon thing i'm not sure what happened there because he's still like in a now executive chairman kind of bullshit role. Sorry, everyone yeah. who is an executive chairman. But all these kind of political plays when, when you are stepping out of the chief executive officer and you create like a, another role that's still on top of the other. I mean, it's I, I don't like that. I think it's it's bullshit, right? Come on, like don't don't do these things. You know, if you step down, you step down and you let someone else take over. You can you can be a consultant as an advisor or whatever if you want to have some, you know, handover time or whatever. But I think it's it's very odd that they do these things. Always yeah, I politics. totally agree. I think if you're going to do a leadership change, like go full hog on it too. I mean, there are guys that have been in that WTA leadership role for more than 10 years. I'm a big advocate for, you know, your, your tenure, like you need change after 10 years. Like, I'm sorry, yeah. like things need to move around. There's a reason why, you know, we have terms on board roles and those types of positions, because it's important not to, to get stagnant and to have new ideas. I think it's, um, you know, well known that there's not that many women in, in the leadership roles at the WTA either. And I think that that's, um, you know, a missed opportunity. And um, you would think, again, it's like one can be sympathetic of, okay, yeah, maybe they did get hit really hard because of Peng Shui and COVID and losing dollars from, from that. And if they came out and put their hands up of like, we're in, we're in a bad situation or we, we're, you know, transitioning um they started wta ventures they kind of have new things going on and you can tell they're kind of working on it so from my perspective as a fan but also just someone in a, in a marketing type of role is like it's better to be a little bit more transparent 
and kind of say like, yeah, we we know like the last two, three years like haven't been our best. Um, and maybe you need to hold the finals at a venue that already exists in, in a place that is kind of a home run where you know you're going to get turnout. You know, go, go to London, go to New York, go to go to uh, any of those venues in Europe where you know you have good fan turnout. You don't have to spend $4 million on creating this, you know, stadium in a touristy area of Cancun and announcing it six weeks before. It just seems bizarre to me. If you are struggling to get the deal done with Saudi, and that means that you can't get it, you can't get it announced until this summer, then do the deal for 2025 and pick the venue now as the interim solution and pick it in a place where you know you can get fans that don't have to, you know, travel to a random tourist destination at a time of year that's not even a good time to go. It's just, I don't, I don't understand that strategy. I can totally be sympathetic to business challenges in general and needing to find ways to, um, I don't know, stop the bleeding or find a Band-Aid solution until you have a long-term solution, but like do a good job at the Band-Aid solution. And and I, I don't understand the, the thinking or the process behind that whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah, it did strike me as weird because it's such an important marketing vehicle, the tournaments, like the main yeah. tournaments. And if, if you then throw one and, and take it, like, a, there's a big chance, I would say. Like, it's also like, oh, it's storm season in Cancun. Like, it, everyone knows that. So it's like, yeah. okay, weather's going to be bad. There's no court. Like, you don't do that. Like, that that seems to me that's even better to cancel the whole event than be like, okay, hey, guys, we need, we have a problem, you know, whatever. I don't know. Yeah. But it seemed to me, like, very strange, uh, very yeah. much uh like fire fest you know <laughs> yeah totally unnecessary vibe. risk it just didn't need it just didn't need to go that way and yeah if they had whatever issues getting it done with done somewhere else then um put your hands up and be like <laughs> couldn't couldn't get it over the line like let's hold it at you know whatever venue that fans are going to turn up to and just and just go that route um it just felt like they were trying to do too much and uh yeah it was it was just such a shame that that also then impacted the quality of the tennis at the end of the day as well, um, which is what we want to get excited about. And as you say, it's sort of like the, one of those big moments of the year and it just totally felt um, like that didn't yield a good marketing outcome or a good playing outcome, which uh, in the end then leads to a total flop. So, 100%. Yeah. So you will go to more tournaments. Do you have anything planned for or already that you can announce or you're you're just making the plans as we go yeah uh, i definitely will be at indian wells i um i'm hoping to get to a day or two of the san diego open as well which is now happening the week before indian wells usually that was in september that's a wta 500 event so i'm uh hoping to get up to that one um maybe try to work on a deal for sunshine double if i can get myself to miami that would be a lot of fun um but if anything uh got French Open on my list. I've never been to Roland Garros, so I'm super excited to to make that one happen this year and, and try to get to tournaments that I've not been to, but um Wimbledon is always on my list too. So I'm hoping to hoping to make those two work. Yeah, those are great. Like okay. those are our, our top top notch events. Yeah. Uh, so that's good. And your own tennis, you're playing how many times a week? Oh, unfortunately, I am nursing a bad back and I am going to be out for another two or three months, sadly. Um, but I was playing like four or five days a week. And if, if anyone needs a reminder to, you know, do your warm ups properly, do your activations, make sure you do your off court work because I'm I'm paying the price for playing too much and not looking after myself well enough. And um yeah, it's uh, something I've dealt with for a long time. So I'm just sort of uh, back in the rehab train and um, we'll get back on court soon enough, I hope. That's a great, uh, great advice. I see that a lot and I've done it myself as well. When you overplay and you're not doing the gym in between, like if I do every other, I mean, if I do gym before tennis, it's it's so much better. Like if yeah. you feel it and you, you, you usually go to the gym, you train quite a lot, right? Yeah, and I will say kind of last year, I just got so excited and happy about playing tennis. And so I kind of, once I fall out the routine with my gym, then sometimes it's hard to like get back into it. I'm like, oh, I'd just rather play for two hours. And um, yeah, you can't you can't get away with it at 26 like you can when you're 16, 17 and show up and, and just play for two hours. So um, yeah, I uh, back, 
back to my gym routines and my glute bridges and my pelvic tilts and we'll we'll do that till the cows come home and I can play again so <laughs> yeah awesome well well good luck on your media habits and your media engagements and your rehab because i know it's tough when you're rehabbing an injury and when you can't play that's the worst that's really ugh, mentally tough yeah uh, but it's going in the right path otherwise and i'm hope to see you at some event but otherwise yeah. we do a podcast whenever you want that's you know where i am so uh, i gotta get you fun. on my channel too and um you let me know are you coming to indian wells We'll see. I'm trying to plan that now. I'm last minuting okay. this one, but yeah, yeah, we'll see if I, I pop down there. But I, I'll, the French Open, the European tour, I will definitely be around usually. Okay. So um, that that should be it. But we'll see. Maybe US, maybe Miami is fun. I don't know. Yeah, that would be awesome. We should make it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's cool to get the like content creator community uh, in in similar places because it's like a fun Avengers Assemble vibe <laughs> to it, you know. It's like... <laughs> I love that. We all got to have our own characters. <laughs> exactly. You know, you have to dress up so it's like kind of, you know, stands out a bit. I'd love that. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> all right. Thanks, uh, Lisa. And uh, we'll keep in touch. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me back. It was a lot of fun.